Well, that was actually quite timely because my opening question is this, ever faced a situation where things did not work out as planned or as expected? (laughs) Which is exactly what happened to a Pharisee in the passage that we will be considering this morning. But it was something that gave this man probably the best learning opportunity of his life. And I think that's a lesson for us all. It's a, very, it's a hard but a very healthy attitude to cultivate that when things don't seem to be going to plan, ask ourselves the question, what could God be teaching me through this? One of the key themes of Luke, both in his gospel narrative and in the book of Acts, is salvation and forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, There are a number of unique uh, statements, uh, parables and events recorded by Luke. And the parable that, uh, the event and parable we'll look at this morning is one such occurrence. We see that a Pharisee invites Jesus to his home. Jesus accepts the invitation. He goes to the house and he reclines at the table. Now, for many houses in those days, people just may do with mats on the floor, but for the more affluent, of which this Pharisee was probably one, you would have a table and a couch. And people would generally lean on the left-hand side, leaving the right arm and hand free to partake of the food, and the legs then would be stretched out behind them. And if the table was in a, a, a circular format, then the couch was likewise. You had a circular configuration. It was very often located outside a bit towards in a courtyard, which meant that people could actually wander in and out to listen to what was being said if there was a rabbi or a special guest there. It was a culture that put more store in wisdom than it did in privacy. Why did this Pharisee, who we learn from Jesus himself was called Simon, invite Jesus to his house? Well, we don't know. His motive is unclear. It could have been that he had a genuine interest. He may have had an ulterior motive. He could have been undecided about Jesus. He'd he'd been impressed by aspects of the teaching. Maybe he thought, maybe this guy could be a prophet. But he was unsure of some of the company that he was keeping. We know in some of the preceding chapters in Luke, some of the Pharisees were already looking for a way to accuse Jesus. Maybe Simon was part of that, trying to set up a trap. But whatever his plans were, they were completely turned on their heads. Because suddenly a woman comes into the home and interrupts proceedings. Now it didn't take them very long, either by her reputation or by her appearance, for them to realise that this was a woman of the city who is a sinner. It doesn't say that she was a prostitute. It's a traditional view that she was a prostitute. Scripture doesn't say that. But nevertheless, she comes in, she finds Jesus, she stands behind Jesus and begins to wet his feet with her tears wipe his feet with her hair, kiss his feet, and then pour perfume on them. Now, verses 36 to 39 do not actually record any conversation taking place, but let's not underestimate the raw energy and emotion of this extraordinary scene, the ripple effect that would have gone through this household the moment that woman crossed the door. The shock and the horror of the Pharisee and his guests. Because generally the Pharisees, they would gather up their robes, they would recoil away if any prostitute or, 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 or sinner came near them. Just, just to have any contact was viewed as a contamination. And not only that, during the course of events here, this woman actually lets down her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. That was something a woman would only do in private for her husband. To do it in public was an absolute scandal. And they just would have been horrified by what they saw before them. The stares that would have gone round the room from this woman to Jesus to one another thinking, what is happening here? Why is Jesus not reacting and getting this woman cast out of this house? And even Simon himself was saying to himself, oh, Jesus, there's no way this man is a prophet. If he was, he'd have known what kind of woman this was. He would surely have got her dismissed. Jesus turns to Simon. He says, Simon, I have something to tell you. Simon says, teach away. And so Jesus gives a parable and then gets to the heart of the matter by asking Simon a question. He says, two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? 
Owing 550 denarii was like a month's wage. 500 was close to two, two years. It's a lot of money. Two debtors, neither of whom could make good their debt. They were both in the same legal position. They were both in the same boat. They were both equally condemned and at risk of being imprisoned. But the creditor, the money lender, forgave the debts of both. And so Jesus asked the question, now which of them will love him more? It's, it's true to life. There's nothing incredible about the question in that sense. Generally, we know the greater a debt that is forgiven, the greater the help that we get, usually the greater the love that will come back in return. And Simon answers along those lines, is commended by Jesus for doing so. But in the process, it means that the application of the parable from Simon's perspective becomes unanswerable. He couldn't later evade the implications of it. And so Jesus now turns to the woman, but is still speaking to Simon. And he says, do you see this woman? And Jesus goes on to contrast the lack of common courtesy from Simon against the actions of the woman. In those days, when a guest came into the house because of the dusty roads, it was the courtesy of the host to give the guest some water to wash the feet and a towel. Simon had not done that. This woman had washed the feet of Jesus with her tears and wiped his feet with her hair. It was common courtesy to give a greeting and a holy kiss. It still takes place today in the East. Simon hadn't done that. This woman was kissing the feet of Jesus. It was common courtesy for the host to give fragrant oil, a little bit of ointment to the head, to the, the guest. It meant that the heat of the house or even the heat of one's body, suddenly the fragrance would start to uh, be, be smelled around the room. Simon hadn't done that, but this woman was pouring perfume on the feet of Jesus. And then Jesus hammers home the application. He says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Simon... I know exactly who this woman is. I know exactly the many sins that she has committed, but can't you see her great expression of love shows that she knows her sins have been forgiven. And then turning to the woman properly, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Now before we proceed, let's get three mis common misconceptions out of the way from this passage. First of all, this is not Contrary to popular views, Mary Magdalene. She is, Mary Magdalene is first mentioned in verse 2 of Luke chapter 8. And he was too good an historian not to give an explicit link if this, the woman was one and the same. She's only, Mary Magdalene then only reappears in the crucifixion and the post-resurrection accounts. Now, we do have three similar accounts in the other gospel records, Matthew, Mark, and John, of a woman anointing Jesus. But they come with key differences. The others were in Bethany. They were in the house of Simon the leper, not Simon the Pharisee. The head was anointed, particularly in the accounts of Matthew and Mark. The disciples were present, and the woman there was not described as a sinner. And then John brings out additional aspects when he's the only one who actually gives a name, which is Mary, but goes on then to talk about Martha and Lazarus. So by implication, it is Mary, the sister of uh, Martha. In John's account, yes, the feet are anointed and they are also wiped with hair. But the evidence points to these being different incidents with same events, not one event that has been shoehorned into varying accounts. Secondly, more importantly, this is not the point at which this woman was first saved. The tense of the verbs in verse 47 and 448 is in the perfect tense. It is not your sins are forgiven now at this moment, but your sins have been at some time in the past, however recent, forgiven. Possibly in some of the earlier events that Luke records in chapters 5 and 6 and 7 of the crowds gathering to hear Jesus, she may well have been amongst them. It may well be that he was under the, the ministry of John the Baptist. As Jesus said to the chief priests in Matthew chapter 21, For John came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe him. Also, and even more critically, it was not her expression of love that saved her. 
It's not that Jesus looked at this extravagant expression of love and worship and said, that's good enough for me. Your sins are forgiven. You're now saved. No, her love was an expression of knowing that her sins had been forgiven. And that was the point that Jesus was driving home to Simon. And through the word of God, Jesus comes and he says to you and I today, I have something to tell you. What do we see? What do we learn when we look at this woman? From her actions directly and then in comparison with Simon the Pharisee. First of all, and secondly, we'll take them both together. I would suggest she came without delay and she came without distraction. It was decisive. We are told that when the wo a woman of the city, who was a sinner, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she also came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. She made a very quick decision. Because Jesus, later on, when describing her kissing his feet, actually says to Simon, from the time I entered your house, she has not stopped. There was no delay with this woman. There was no distraction. She knew her sin. She knew her shame, her way of life, her battered reputation, the gossip, the insinuations, the public rejection, the fears of thinking, what are people going to think of me? The challenge of going into, of all places, a Pharisee's house passing the guests who would not have been few in number, with all the looks of, 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 of disdain that would have occurred, and still she came. Nothing was going to hold her back. She came without delay. She came without distraction. It was decisive. Why? She came to see Jesus, and Jesus only. Hallelujah to express her love and gratitude to him, to honor him, to praise and glorify the name of Jesus, to give him her adoration, to give him her devotion and worship and in service. She came without delay. She came without distraction. She also came with wholehearted devotion. You see, when you look at the attitude of this woman and, 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 and Simon as a, a Pharisee, she came with a committed devotion. Simon was there just with a cold detachment. You could, uh, you could say that she came with her whole being. She came with her whole heart. Simon was just there with his intellect. You could, you could almost say that she came with a knowledge of God. Simon was just there with, with a knowledge about God. She came with wholehearted devotion. She was changed, transformed internally, completely. Why? Because she was willing to give Jesus control. She was willing to be vulnerable. Simon was not willing to do either. He was keeping things on an intellectual level, keeping things at arm's distance. One of the best definitions of commitment I came across recently was this, putting your weight on something to the point of vulnerability. You lift your feet two inches off the floor. Now you're committed to those seats. I'm told they're working very, very well, apart from two in the fourth row there. But there, there we go. That is commitment. That is trust. This woman was willing to be vulnerable. It's the same in relationships, isn't it? It's when we open up that we suddenly become vulnerable. Uh, and then you, we, people know us and... We're then in a position where people could actually abuse that and hurt us. And some people have experienced that and then begin to clam up. They don't open up to anyone and suddenly relationships become harder and life becomes a much more lonely experience. This woman was willing to be vulnerable. She gave Christ the preeminence. If we assume that she was a prostitute, one of the things that they did was they used to carry around their necks or on a necklace a little vial, a little flask, of perfume. It was, you could say it was part of the attraction, even a tool of the trade in a sense. But this woman had taken this perfume and she was anointing the feet of Jesus. She was effectively saying, I have better use for this now because I am committed to Jesus Christ. And to relate to Jesus, this woman was willing to give Jesus wholehearted devotion. We cannot relate to Jesus and stay in control of our lives. We worship 
something or someone we are just made to worship. And if it's not Jesus, it will be someone else. And if we stay in control, it means we're wanting to worship someone other than Jesus. Simon the Pharisee was not willing to give Jesus control. He was representative of of people who want to check Jesus out first. They're coming with a load of questions that they want to be answered first before they will commit. They're coming with their, their own terms and conditions. God has got to accept me in certain aspects of the way I want to live before I will believe on him and so they stay at a distance they are not willing to be committed fully to the Lord Jesus Christ they want to see how they can best fit Jesus into their way of life rather than their life being changed through the Lord Jesus Christ you see Simon was in effect treating Jesus like he was treating any of the other guests well you could argue he didn't even manage to do that with the the lack of courtesy at the welcome But he was treating Jesus just like any other guest. Jesus will not be treated like any other guest. When he later on says to the woman, your sins are forgiven, the other guests begin to see the implication. And they go, who is this who even forgives sins? You see, when we recognize and respond to Jesus for who he truly is, he is not just another guest. He is Lord and Saviour. He is the one and only living God whom we want to know deeply and in real devotion. This woman not only came without delay, not only came without distraction, she came with wholehearted devotion. And she was also wholly dependent as well. The woman depended on Jesus alone for her salvation. Many people will take the view that, oh, well, this woman needed salvation more than the other person, more more than Simon. I mean, Simon was a much more moral character, and there's no disputing that. That was the reputation the Pharisees had. But it is wrong to say that this woman needed Jesus and salvation more than the other. And many people have a, a common view which thinks that, oh, yes, there are some people in this world, you look at their immoral lives, their messed up lives, their psychological needs. Yes, they need faith. They need religion. They do need some sort of forgiveness and salvation. But the rest of us, no, we're almost there. We're not too bad, actually. All we need is a bit more instruction, a bit more education, a bit more money, a bit more opportunity. But note the key point in this parable. Neither debtor could pay their debt. Both were in the same boat. Legally, they were in the same position. Excuse the rather graphic illustration, but one of the programs I enjoy watching is Silent Witness. I love the insight into the forensic pathology and what they can deduce. And in one episode, there were two victims of a fire that looked totally different. One of them was, was there with only just a few scratches on uh, the face and on a limb. Another one was there which was a totally burnt corpse beyond all recognition. One may have looked more like a human being than the other, but they were both equally dead. You may have two people from Swansea who find themselves alone out in the Atlantic Ocean. One is a hundred miles off the west coast of Wales, the other a thousand. One of them may be a lot closer to home than the other, but they are both equally lost and doomed. And Jesus, through this parable, was also effectively saying that he is the creditor. And everything we have, everything we have, is on loan from God, our creator. We depend on him. A minister was once asked at a funeral, you don't happen to know how much they left to you? To which he replied, everything, we always do. Yes, we can work hard and think that we have excelled in life, but with what? The very life that we have, the energy, the intellectual ability, the moral reasoning we have, the resources, the creativity, the appreciation of beauty, they're all from God in the first place. We depend on Him. That's why anything we create, and we are in a world with incredible inventions, have in one sense got an aspect of plagiarism stamped all over them. 
the very resources, the very laws of nature being applied, they're all of God's creation in the first place. Healing, even you know, the healing of our bodies, we marvel at what medicine can do. But all of it is working with the healing properties that God has built into the human body. There is none of it that's unique to ourselves. We are all dependent upon him, which is one reason why our possessions and our achievements and our good works cannot clear our debt with God. They're all from him in the first place. And of course, sin, the main reason of our debt with God, is not just breaking some rules, but it's a very desire to reject the wisdom and grace of God and to live independently of God. Anyone who thinks that their good works are going to get them to heaven are not depending on God. They want to be in control. They actually hate. It's one of the things about sin. We hate depending upon God. This woman didn't need salvation more than the other. She realized she needs salvation more than the other. Simon, you see, did not see the gravity of his sin. The Pharisees wanted a God who was small enough to compromise and pretend that their imperfect but better than most keeping of the law was adequate, a salvation small enough for their merits to earn it. This parable blew that right out of the water because neither could make good their debt. This woman had seen the gravity of her sin. Not only that, she had seen the cost of salvation. You see, someone has to pay for a debt. A debt cannot just be forgiven. It has to be transferred. If someone says a debt's cancelled, the debt itself doesn't just disappear into the ether. If someone owes money to a financial institution, they may be declared bankrupt or they may have the debt cancelled, but the institution still has the debt on their hands. Someone still has to absorb it, has to eat it, has to swallow it in that sense. So a debt never just disappears into the ether. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who died to pay for our debt of sin and paid it in full. This woman was not, not only came without delay, without distraction, she came with wholehearted devotion and was wholly dependent on Jesus. And she therefore knew the way of deliverance. For Jesus told her, your sins are forgiven. It was her faith in Christ that he then emphasized. What a contrast to her her entrance when he then declared that you can go and walk in peace. She trusted in Jesus. She gave him control. And the result was that she was then able to go and walk in peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. What did she do next? Well, we don't know. (laughs) We're, We're not told. Her transformation was undeniable. The first few verses of uh, Luke chapter 8 are very interesting. Jesus then went out teaching in various towns and villages. The 12 were with them. And then Luke actually mentions by name some women who were with them. And then he says, and many others. It's a tantalizing thought that this woman who anointed the feet of Jesus could be among those many others who then went and helped to support Jesus and the disciples. What about Simon? (laughs) Again, we don't know. It's very easy to be dismissive, as we often are, of all the Pharisees. Once a Pharisee, always a Pharisee. I've got little doubt that he would have, during this conversation, he would have got pretty well worked up. Um, First of all, he had his intentions to invite Jesus there. He has an interruption. And this interruption is not just by another, it's then by a sinful woman, a woman of the city. And Jesus, contrary to Simon's expectations, does not ask for her to be dismissed. And in fact, Simon then finds, despite having given it, opened up his home and a meal to the Lord Jesus, he finds himself being ticked off. And this sinful woman commended. And not only that, he then suddenly finds that this sinful woman is then used as an example for him. I tell you, his blood pressure must have been going up like this. Steam must have been coming out of his ears. And then not only with that, but he then sees that Jesus then turns around and says, your sins are forgiven. Not only had Simon was beginning to dismiss him as a prophet, he now finds this man acting as if he's God. And you could just see Simon asking the question, who does this itinerant from Nazareth in backwards Galilee think he is? That's one option. 
We don't know. We really don't know. I was, uh, for the sake of time, I won't go into, into this detail. I was going to quote a verse from uh, singer Don Francisco who wrote, I thought, a cracking song about this event. And uh, he described that reaction of Simon the Pharisee. And the first line of the next verse is then, but instead I sat and trembled, shaken to the core. N- now, uh, that's a bit of songwriter's license. You don't find it in the scripture. And yet, and yet... I know some of you will like to do this. Here's something to take away to look at in your own time. If you throw in the verse from John chapter 12 into the mix about some of the secret believers, the more I looked at this, there are potentially up to six aspects of this account. I will emphasize they are purely circumstantial. They are not definitive. I will not be dogmatic and and, and precious about it. I do not want to be burned at the stake. But there are potentially up to six aspects of this that may just say to us, when combined, do not be too hasty to write this man off. Take it away and let me know what you think. But I find that encouraging because the question comes back to us, what about us? What about us? How do we respond to this? What do we learn? It, 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 it's very easy to say, oh, a Pharisee, a prostitute. What have I got to do with them? There's nothing here for me. I, I, I tell you what, the moment you say that, you've jumped into the shoes of one of the characters in this event. We are all one of these two characters. And as Christians, we sometimes find ourselves oscillating between the two. First of all, delay. Are you delaying coming to the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you don't reject Jesus you just respect him oh he's another guest you just respect him my dear friend that is tantamount to being the same thing as rejection because Jesus will not be treated like any other guest when we recognize who he is the gravity of our sin our need for salvation when we recognize who he is and receive him we do not come to Jesus with respect we come to Jesus in repentance and reverence Are you delaying coming to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want control and that you want to leave it as late as possible like the dying thief on the cross? Many people look at that thief and think, oh, I can leave it to the last moment. Pastor Colin S. Smith, in his superb little book, Heaven, How I Got Here, brings out a tremendous counter perspective. The book is written from the view of the thief. It's like his testimony in a sense. And this is what he says. Some people say I trusted Christ at the last moment, but the way I look at it, I trusted Christ at my first opportunity, and that's what you should do. Trust him now. Jesus says, I have got something to tell you. Are you delaying? Jesus has got something to tell you. He says, look at this woman. She came without delay, and she came without distraction. Today is the day of salvation. When we search our hearts, what's our motivation for being here? What's our motivation for coming? Have we come to see Jesus and to give him all the praise and the honour and the glory? Or are we easily distracted? More regretful of of our failings, more concerned about what other people are going to think of us in our expression of praise than to give Christ the praise and the thanks that are due to his name. Whoever has been forgiven much, loves much. Delay. Are you delaying, my friend? Jesus says to you this morning, see this woman, she came without delay. Come to Jesus today. What about control? It's too easy to get into a position of hating to be dependent on God. Even as Christians, we, we want to feel as though we're in control of things. We can look at our failure and say, you know, I should have been more controlled back then. I should have been smarter, more skilled. I should have been more good. We want to be in control of our progress in a sense, doing things in the church, praising God in a certain way, witnessing in a certain way and thinking, ah, do you know that almost places God in a position of obligation? He's seen me do all these things. He's surely going to bless me. We love that sense of control. Maybe some of us want the control in that we will not commit to, uh, to the service of God until we feel we've got ourselves to a certain spiritual standard, a certain position of knowledge, of confidence before committing to Jesus. And then we wonder why there's a lack of progress even after many years. Maybe we're not committing because we don't like certain aspects of church life. We want to be in control. The services aren't the way I want. The praise isn't the way I want. We want control rather than wholehearted devotion to Christ. Maybe we're scared of what other people are going to think of us. 
this woman, when she came into that Pharisee's house, she didn't come to compete. She knew fine well she was in the presence of people who were well known for being the most moralistic, the biggest givers, and some of the biggest prayers around. And they liked it to be known. She wasn't there to compete with them. She was there to see Jesus, and Jesus only, and give him her wholehearted devotion. Even a few words of thanks were genuine and gloriously responsive to the love of Christ within her life. Jesus says, I have something to tell you. Are you held back by control this morning, my dear friend? Jesus says, I have something to tell you. Do you see this woman? She came with wholehearted devotion and she was wholly dependent upon the Lord. Her extravagant worship was a response to the extravagant grace for the forgiveness of her sins. Many people would say, forgiven? Why do I need forgiven? This woman didn't say that. She said, forgiven? Why me, God? Why has your grace come into my life? And, what, you know, if we want to love Christ more in that sense, it involves cultivating an enhanced awareness of how much we've been forgiven. If you want to see the dynamic love as exemplified by this woman, as passionate as, as she displayed, we have to have, this, have the same awareness of the gravity of our sinfulness that she had. Because love stems from gratitude. And gratitude grows from a sense of need and an inability to meet that need by ourselves. And if our hearts need adjustment, there's only one place to come. And that's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage doesn't mention the cross of Jesus or his plans to die. But nevertheless, there is a question that hovers in the background. How can God forgive this sinful woman without himself being unjust? And it applies to us all. How does God forgive us? The answer comes at the cross, where Christ paid the debt of our sins where Christ bore our sins on the cross and satisfied God's justice and secured our forgiveness. How are our hearts this morning? Is Christ just another guest, just part of the routine, or do we come to him without delay, without distraction, with wholehearted uh, devotion and wholly dependent upon the Lord? For he is our saviour and Lord, and we enjoy an intimate knowledge of who he truly is. Someone recently summed it up very nicely. I think it was Kathy Keller. She said this, In the Bible we see that a response of thanksgiving ultimately marks the difference between a person whose Christianity is a system of works righteousness and a Christian who is operating out of a framework of grace. If we understand that we are sinners saved by grace, then the things we do in response to that grace are acts of loving appreciation and not to gain anything. Our acts of thanksgiving are a product of knowing Christ uh, of knowing Christ has done the work for us. And when we act on that, it is simply to honour him and to thank him. What's the response of our hearts? Jesus has something to tell us. Do you see this woman? Do you come without delay? Do you come without distraction? Do you come with wholehearted devotion? Do we come wholly dependent upon the Lord? Our closing hymn is a very challenging hymn in that regard. I trust we will sing it truthfully, humbly, and prayerfully. Take my life and let it be. Consecrated Lord to thee, take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. And the hymn writer must have had one of these anointing events in mind when they said, take my love, my Lord I pour. At thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Let us sing that hymn together then, shall we? Take my life and let it be. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who speaks. We thank you that you are a God who forgives. We thank you that you are a God who draws us to yourself. You have had something to say to see the attitude and the actions of this woman who came without delay, without distraction, with wholehearted devotion and wholly dependent on you. May, Lord, our response be likewise as we dedicate our lives afresh to you, thanking you for the full forgiveness, the debt that you have paid that we cannot pay at all. Lord, where there's areas of our lives that we want to stay in control, come by your Spirit and help us to give those over to you afresh, I pray. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Let us.